Hello, my name is Bob and once again I would like to welcome you to another episode on the White Dog Garage YouTube channel. This episode is the first part of a three-part series in which I'm going to show you how I built this portable 12 volt battery auxiliary battery system. It's pretty in-depth build and that's why I've spread it over three parts. The first part will cover the components of the system, the wiring diagram, modifying the basic box to take the components. In the second part, I'll show you the actual wiring up of the components and how it all goes together. And in the third and final part, I'll show you how I fit it to a vehicle and how it operates. And I hope you'll follow along. So I've gathered all the pieces together. I've got 105 amp hour absorbed glass mat battery. I have a DC to DC charger, cables, fuses, and an accessory power point and 12 volt meter so that I can keep an eye on the uh, battery plus various connectors and the battery box of course that it'll all be going in. The reason I'm doing this is so the battery box is portable from vehicle to vehicle or just able to be taken out of the vehicle and used at the campsite and equally I can take it out of the vehicle when it's not needed in the vehicle. This battery weighs over 30 kilos, uh, almost 70 pounds. It's quite a heavy unit as absorbed glass mat batteries are and it's not something you just want to be carting around the vehicle at all times. I don't want to hardwire it in. And secondly, I want to be able to move it to other vehicles that we have. I have developed a wiring diagram for the battery box. In the middle, I've placed the battery. And on one side, I've placed the input. And on the other side, the output. We'll talk about the input first. So, the crux of the input is the DC-DC charger. This charger can take power from a vehicle, can also take power from a solar uh, cell. So it's being set up with two input plugs, they're Anderson plugs, they're high current or yeah, high value current plugs. One takes power from the vehicle and feeds it to the DC charger. The other one takes power from a solar input and feeds it to the DC DC charger. I've not used colours but I've labelled each line plus and minus for negative and positive, positive and negative. If you want to copy this obviously just stop the video and I don't know take a screenshot Okay, moving on from the DC-DC charger has one output which feeds to the battery and just before the battery will be a 50 amp fuse. The negative earth continues feeding both to the plugs to the DC charger. There's no earth wire coming out of the DC charger and you continue the negative earth across to the battery. Okay, so we've got the battery now and we're moving to the output side. On the output side we put another 50 amp fuse in place with an Anderson plug. This is a high current feed for whatever purpose that you want to run it from. And I've taken off before then, and it's important you take it off before the 50 amp fuse, um, a 20 amp fuse and that in turn feeds to the 12 volt socket which will be in the lid of the battery box and also to a voltmeter but for the voltmeter I have fitted an on off or will be fitting an on off switch which will enable me to turn the voltmeter off when it's not needed. So. The first thing we're undoing here, or unpacking here, is the battery itself. This um, is a 
Pull River brand. I'll get that right. You can see it better than I can. It is 105 amp hours, 12 volt of course. It's absorbed glass mat uh, battery. It's a deep cycle battery. Comes in a neat box like this. There's all sorts of warranty information. And with a little bit of luck I can get it out. More so with the help of a knife. Now the products I'm using here, nobody's paid me to use their products. Um, these are products I've used in the past and I've not had any problems with them. So take that for what it's worth. Um, I'm certainly not saying buy these, you buy whatever suits you. Um, I'm just saying that the ones I'm using are ones that I have used with success. Trust me, quite a heavy battery. But the first thing I want to do is actually drop it in the battery box. And I almost need a, I think the top is reversible. I don't think there's a right or left to this, no. Okay. Drop is indeed the word. I've just taken off the lifting handle. It's not going very far. I'm going to see if I can recycle the packing as a bit of extra stiffening for the battery. See how much movement I've got from side to side. Vibration kills batteries, so anything you can do to stop vibration is a good thing. Okay, there are bolts that go in. So flat washer, spring washer goes directly under the head of the bolt, then the flat washer, and then it screws in from memory and looking at them, looking at the top, they're M8 I think. Uh, it's made in China, so it's probably M8. Why I'm setting up the battery first is that this gives me, I guess, a position and a level for the items that I'm going to stick in the lid. The lid sits above the battery so there's a bit of room for uh, items to go in and I'll be putting items along there and leaving these two um, for cables now this is just good practice it's not about something you have to do you can get away with it, plenty of people do, including myself. But I just like to put a bit of tape over it, the terminals, just so I don't accidentally arc out the battery.
So it's all safe to play with now and we'll move on to working with it. I first cut holes for the accessory plug and the voltmeter. To do this I started by sticking tape where they were going to go and then marking out the position on the tape face. I found the halfway measurement between the top and the lip and drew a line at this position. I then measured 40 millimeters out from the center ridge and marked this off on the center line. This will be the position of the hole for the accessory socket. I then determined the distance between centres of the accessory socket and the adjacent voltmeter. They are both the same diameter and the easy way to get this measurement is to measure the distance from the outside of one to the corresponding outside of the other. Then I used a hole saw on my drill to make the two holes for the voltmeter and the accessory socket. I then unscrewed the securing rings from the back of the voltmeter and the accessory socket, positioned the both of them through the holes in the box top and re-threaded and tightened up the two rings. I then pre-drilled holes and fitted screws to hold the front bracket for the voltmeter and accessory socket, finishing it off by fitting the bezel or cover. I then made a rectangular hole for the voltmeter switch. I applied masking tape to the general position. Onto this I marked the rectangle that I needed to cut out. Cut out the rectangle. I first drilled two 8mm holes at the ends of the rectangle and I then used my jigsaw to cut out the rectangle before finishing it off with a file. The switch is a push fit and has integral spring clips underneath which secure it in place.
This is the DC DC battery charger. It is projector brand, as I've said before. Anything that I'm using here are their materials or components that I've used before. Nobody's paying me to advertise their products. Uh, I've used them with success in the past, and but that's a sample of one. So it's up to you what you use. So it comes in a neat box, tells you what you need to do, usual warranty, instruction manual. The charger itself comes with bare wires labelled as to what they do and so installation is for you to do or the, the buyer to do. They do provide some componentry. These pieces are for making joins in the cables and these are cable insulation material, zip ties, and here's what you're paying the real money for, which is the DC-DC charger. This one does a variety of battery types, and it works with solar and vehicle inputs. Each one of these has been labelled, it's the earth or ground wire. This wire, I'll come back to that wire, this one goes on the battery and its purpose is to monitor the temperature of the battery and tell the charger whether it's getting too hot or not. This is important because the charger, the, it's an IDC25 and the 25 stands for 25 amps and it can if it wants to pump in 25 amps of charge. So this is the output wire it's not red, it's brown, but basically that's the supply which goes to the battery. This is the input from the vehicle. This is the input from your solar cell if you have one. Other wires are provided. You can have an external LED which tells you whether it's on or not. You can, if you have a relatively modern vehicle with a what they call a smart alternator, which uh, slows up or slows down depending on what it thinks of your fuel consumption, etc. Uh, and basically it cuts back the power uh, to the battery. This uh, can be connected into the ignition system of the vehicle, tells the charger whether the ignition is on or not, so that basically with a conventional alternator, when the battery charge falls below, I'm guessing it's about 12.5 volts, 12.2 volts, it shouts off. When the battery, or when the charge going in, the input into the battery charger exceeds that value, it takes power and feeds it into the battery that it's charging. With the smart alternators, they can drop down to 11.8 uh, volts and just hold it there, and that's not really charging the battery. But this one can take that 11.8 volts and turn it back into power that will charge your battery. But it needs the ignition to tell you that it's on. Otherwise, if the ignition is not on, it will just assume that the battery or the vehicle has been turned off and it will turn off the charging to the auxiliary battery. I worked out where the DC-DC charger would be mounted and then proceeded to drill a hole in the back of the lid to take the cable bundle. Once again, applying masking tape to the general area 
before marking out the exact position for the hole. I then drilled holes to mount the DC-DC charger, again applying masking tape, onto which I marked the positions for the screws. Finally, I drilled two 8mm diameter holes at the tops of the three positions with a high current for Anderson plugs for the output, the alternator input and solar input would be mounted. That brings us to the end of part one. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did I'd welcome a thumbs up and by all means share it amongst your friends and even people who aren't your friends. Don't forget to tune in for parts two and three of the video and if you're not already subscribed the best way to do this is to hit the subscribe bar down below. While you're there ding the bell so that you'll be reminded by YouTube when the next parts of this three part series come out. Of course, if you've come in late, then the three parts might already be up. And somewhere on the screen, there should be links that will take you there. Otherwise, I'd just like to thank you again for watching. Thank you.